Okay, well, it is 6.04, so we can get this webinar started tonight. My name is Grace Kim. I am the Equine Extension Assistant um, for the 4-H Horse Program. And tonight's topic will be over horsemanship with our clinician, Lori Jackson. Um, tonight's recording or lecture webinar will be recorded and put on our Equine YouTube webinar page if you guys are not able to get on tonight or want to rewatch it for a future um, dates. I will move it on to Lori Jackson. Hello everybody, welcome. Uh, my name is Lori Jackson, as Grace said, and I am the equestrian team coach for the University of Nebraska. Um, tonight we're talking about horsemanship, but some things to consider is, um, you know, some of this information is relevant to whether you're doing hunt seat or, you know, different disciplines, because I actually coach both the Western team and the hunt seat team, and some of this stuff is, is super similar. So anyway, just something to consider. So um, uh, the topic tonight is things to consider while preparing and going into the show pen. So the very first thing I tell everyone, no matter what you're competing in, is to know your rules. Um, basically, for anything that you participate in, whether it's a judged event or a um, timed event, make sure that you know the rules of that association. Rules can differ. Um, for instance, rules for each rules for timed events such as barrel racing can be different than high school rodeo, which could be different, you know, among other um, associations. So make sure that you do that, um, that you uh, know your rules. Um, in any association, your rule book can be pretty cumbersome. I think that, you know, AQHA's rule book is, you know, over almost 200 pages. You know, you probably don't need to understand the bylaws and the, you know, different things. But for each event, each rule is about, or let's say for horsemanship, for example, that particular um, explanation in the rule book is about two pages, maybe three tops, or maybe even less of the rule book. So make sure that you go through and um, read your rules. And we're gonna um, talk here in a minute why, why that makes sense. So one of the things, um, so I do judge, have judged uh, quite a few horse shows and I've helped a lot of exhibitors, whether it's through the 4-H ranks, through the, you know, breed show ranks, um, open shows through like the college ranks in an collegiate horse show association. Many, many times, whether I'm the judge or even just here, you know, being there as um, uh, uh, watching the event, I a lot of times hear in the stands of, I wonder what the judge is looking for. More times than not, you can understand what the judge is looking for if you really know your rules. That being said, um, I have about five slides here that it's taken right from the 2019 4-H Horse Show Judging Guide, um, and you'll, you'll see the pages there, it quotes the pages, and it talks about the particular rules of all of those um, different um, when I say rules, what we want to think about too in terms of your body parts, okay? What what the judge is wanting and what they're doing. So as this here, and I wonder if I can move, let me move this out of the way here. There we go. So think about this, your hands see in performance. Results as shown by performance of the horse are not to be considered more important than the method used in the rider attaining them. Good hands are paramount. And as we continue to talk, um, we're going to learn that what we do really does impact the horse. So the next four or five slides I'm going to just kind of scan through because you can all go back and review these slides. I don't need to read each one word by word, but as we scan through, you're going to be able to see that um, for every single body part, whether it's your leg position, your hand position, your head position, um, performance of your horse, it's all right in that rule book. So it kind of goes on to, like I said, on hands. Again, this is from your 4-H horse judging guide. You know, your arms, what you want to have your, the position of your arms. Um, a lot of times, even equipment, um, as I'm judging around the state, a lot of times I'll see riders come in with a snaffle bit one-handed. 
again, read your rules. You'll know that that's, you know, if you have a snaffle bit on a junior horse, a smooth snaffle should be rode two handed. Um, you know, uh, as we go through here, the reins talks about light contact with the horse's mouth. You know, we don't want to have a death grip on the horse, but we also want to be able to have a light contact that's functional. Again, I'm going to kind of just breeze through um, these slides because you can go through and read on your own and stuff, but I really encourage everyone to really, you know, either go make a photocopy of these pages and keep that in, in your barn and stuff. So each time, or maybe once a week when you go to ride, um, review these things because they are important. Your basic position, again, this is a pretty long paragraph, but if you actually think about it, it is very important to what we're trying to accomplish. Um, it starts with um, being a functional rider, and that's a big thing that we're gonna talk about, being functional all the time. They, the judge is looking for, remember the judges are horsemen and horsewomen, just like the um, you guys that are going in to perform. In the rail, they wanna see a rider with a strong, secure, proper position. Proper position um, equates to a functional rider. And then again, it talks about um, where the rider should sit with their, um, their seat, where their upper body should be. You want this rider to be in the center of the saddle with the, and forming a straight line. So if you wanna take this, this imaginary line and draw this on the rider, take a line from their ear, down their shoulder, down the seam of their pants to the back of their heel. That's that imaginary line. What that line does is forms a, um, the, the ability for, our, for us to connect with the horse and, and, uh, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Again, we want, the rule says that the rider should be flat, the back should be flat, relaxed and supple. We do not want a stiff rider. Um, rider will be penalized for the legs being excessively behind or in front of the vertical position. Again, that's the line I talked about. And then it talks about where you should have your feet and your toes and all of those things. So like I said, I encourage you to go and ride that or read that every, you know, if not every week, um, every month, but especially if you're a little rusty that you haven't, you know, been able to ride because of the weather and school and things like that. It's something to really think about. Presentation of the horse. Um, we're going to talk about this in a little bit too, but we want, you know, a, a nice healthy horse if, if possible. Um, we don't want a horse to be, you know, look like they're sullen, um, you know, uh, maybe overly tired or anything like that. Performance. Um, here again, it talks about um, what they're looking for in the performance of that rider. Again, we're going to a little bit later, horsemanship's a class that is a little bit different than Western Pleasure in the, in the sense that Western Pleasure is judged primarily on the performance of the horse. Yeah, correctness, brokenness, those kinds of things. Um, this actually, in um, there's a big emphasis on how the rider communicates with the horse. You know, sometimes we'll see two different types of style of horses at the end of our presentation. One's maybe not what you would see in a typical horsemanship pattern, but even still the rider is able to be a functional rider and, and that's something to really think about. So again, you know, this continues on from, like I said, it's just two pages. I think there's actually three pages of the 4-H rule from 42 to 40, 44. Again, the performance is continued. Um, you know, if you have to, it talks about the different types of um, maneuvers that you can do, whether it's circles, counter canter, stop. Um, in a 30 minute webinar, like this could actually, we could spend all day talking about horsemanship. I'm not gonna, like I said, read every single word, but like I said, please consider some of these things because they really are important to what you're trying to accomplish with your horse. Again, more, it talks about your rollback, a 180 pivot. Um, different kinds of things, a two track if you would do that, um, just different maneuvers. Your, again, your simple flying lead change, the definition of both, and then um, kind of how that works. So lots to think about all of these rules, but let's step away from the rule book for just a moment and let's think about this. The horsemanship rule or rules, depending on if you're going by 4-H or different breed shows or you know whatever circuit you're competing in, the horsemanship rule is not about what we do to acquire ribbons in a class. 
It is about the functionality of the writer. Correct body position enhances how the writer can effectively communicate with their horse. The rule helps to explain the most effective way to use your body to connect with your horse to become a team and not a disconnected unit. So back again, there's the reason for those rules because when we can get our body in that correct position, this truly helps how we communicate with our horses. So as I see, again, I, um, I mentioned earlier, I um, coach the equestrian team. Um, one of the things with the team is it's all what we call catch riding, meaning wherever we go, um, we, we travel all over the United States, wherever we go, the riders um, basically draw um, it, uh, a name out of a hat per se, and then that's the horse that they ride. They get no warm up time and they get on and go. Um, so whether it's, you know, seeing riders that are doing that kind of thing or riders at, you know, a 4-H show or different things, here's some common faults that I see riders do all the time. Excessive looking. Remember our horses, they, um, our horses have a tendency to gravitate, gravitate and travel to where we look. If we're looking excessively over our left shoulder or right shoulder, um, you know, that's something that that horse is going to feel and that could cause them to drop their shoulder or, you know, they're wanting to turn where we're looking, but then we're um, trying to get them out. Heels push too down, far down. That meaning a lot of times we get, we want our heel always to be lower than our toe in our stirrup. But a lot of times I see riders that'll come and their heels are pushed very far down. It's almost excessive and it almost becomes a little bit not functional. We do want our heels down, but we don't want to focus on our heels to forsake the functionality of our leg. Um, trying to sit what I call too tall or sit tall. Most of our riders are actually naturally tall. Um, and even when you're in the saddle, if you try to sit really tall, it, it, looks, it makes you look stiff. And if you go back to the rule, it says that we want a, a flat, relaxed back, a functional rider. If we're very stiff trying to sit tall, then that kind of you know, defeats the purpose of what we're doing there. Shoulders are not um, square or they're what we call left behind, meaning if we're riding in a left circle, we should kind of, I, I use a bike analogy a lot. If you're riding a bike and you have your handlebars, when you go to turn your bike, you open that shoulder in the direction of travel. When you want to go straight, your shoulders become square again. And if you want to go the opposite way or go to the right, you open your shoulder to the right to ride your bike. Same thing with our horses. If we are trying to, if you try to turn your bike to the left, but then you have your shoulders going to right, there's gonna be a little bit of disconnect and it's not gonna feel well. Leaning, if we're trying to ask a horse to turn, if we lean, sometimes we get in their way, or that, that can be leaning to side to side or forward or leaning back. We want to always stay back to that rule, stay centered in our saddle. Um, not connecting with our horse. Um, it is important that we do what we call riding from our leg to our hand. We'll talk about the importance of our legs in a little bit, but um, having a little bit of feel that we can always communicate with our horse with just a, a few movements of our fingers. Not having a plan when we're riding, um, especially our horsemanship pattern, we feel rushed or we feel late. We all, we've all had that. Even think about um, having a plan getting to the horse show. Um, if we forget to set the alarm and then suddenly we're late, we're an hour and a half late getting up to get to the horse and then we're the horse show and we're running and throwing the horse on and as we're pulling in, they're starting the first class and we're unloading, we're late, we feel rushed, we feel a lot uh, more organized when we have time to get there, kind of assess the situation and stuff like that. And then um, another, another rider fall I see commonly is our circles not being round and our lines not being straight. So we'll talk about a couple of those things as we go. So we, one example, I'm just gonna show a little video here. One example I see very often is a, what, what I call an oval. Remember when we write a circle, we're gonna talk about a correct circle in a little bit. It is a true circle. We're, an analogy I'm gonna use is the circle writing um, that what I call the hands of a clock. If you put a clock down into the arena, and you ride every single number from 12 o'clock to three o'clock to six o'clock to nine o'clock back to 12 o'clock, 
that your circle is going to be very round. Here's an example of the writer. He's going to be writing an oval, what I call an oval. As you notice, he'll, um, at, he'll, he'll ride up. He'll kind of make a sharp turn. He'll kind of come back down. His horse isn't as balanced. And like I said, he's, um, that's a very common fault of what I see some, some riders do. So let's watch, let's watch this rider go for a moment. So as you'll see, he goes way past the cone. He comes back. Now he's coming down. He has this really long, it's almost a line. He's almost created a line and then he's kind of, now you can see how the horse gets a little unbalanced. So he did not ride that circle. He kind of forfeited some parts of that circle and you could see where that horse on the down, on the bottom side of that, the oval, he kind of brought that horse around. The horse kind of got unbalanced and, and he didn't help the horse out very much. So a few faults that we're kind of thinking about are considerations when we're writing a pattern. And when I talk about these, this is something that most people, every single person has, no matter what, if you're a beginner or at the highest level, we work on, um, I have beginner writers up to open writers um, and everybody in between. It's just something that um, these things everyone struggles with. Nobody's unique. We've all been there. It's just something to kind of be aware of to where when you're going to kind of put a pattern together, together to think about some of these things. So anyway, one of the big things is, is sometimes we tend to surprise our horse. Um, we go, um, we don't balance them, you know, before or after a maneuver. And we'll see some examples of um, the rider on the same horse. We, I did some video clips back before um, we were able, we got shut down at UNL with the, um, the quarantine. Um, we did some video clips and I'll be able to show some examples of him balancing his horse and, and being able to um, go through that. And like I said, make sure that you give your horse warning of what you want them to do. It's, I, I call this having a constant dialogue with your horse, that you're always communicating with them. It's um, another thing to think about is like you have a dance partner. If you're dancing with somebody, you are always communicating. You don't just suddenly not communicate and then a great part in the song, then you just start going and doing something. You wanna communicate with your dance partner all the time. Um, when writing a pattern, a lot of times we'll see a rider going too slow or they don't have enough forward motion. You have to have enough forward motion. Your horse has to have enough energy to get balanced because we're asking them to do several different things. Think of it as doing a basketball layup from the walk. We could make that basket, but it is a very low percentage of success and it's not very functional. If we do it at a jog or even if, at a sprint, if we've practiced that, you know that that layup is going to be a lot um, a lot more functional and you're able to have a higher percentage of those um, shots as you go through um, again we talk I'm going to talk about a lot about having a plan um, when you're going to an unfamiliar destination just like we talked about before you're going to the horse show and you you oversleep but it, let's say you've never been to that horse um, that facility before you generally will probably want to map it out find the best way that you're going considering the quickest route maybe avoiding road construction particularly if you're hauling a horse and a trailer and then you make a plan when you're traveling but remember when you're doing a, a, a plan to travel it does not necessarily that plan does not c consider another animal your truck is not you know you tell your truck where to go when you're having a plan with a horse, you have to think about having a plan with another animal or like I said before, a dance partner. Be sure that you make a plan for both you and your horse. Um, you know, we all have things that we excel at. Same thing with our horses. We have things that we struggle with. Um, make that plan so that you can excel and highlight the things that you can do, you and your dance partner, your horse can do well, but also consider the places that you may struggle and develop a strategy that will work to help you navigate that portion of the pattern. You will not be able to change the pattern. Let's say you're preparing for state 4-H horse show. You cannot change that pattern, but you can change how you, you approach your ride. And then the, one of the um, uh, another example is not giving your horse enough room or using too much space at the arena. You want to be efficient, but you want to give your horse the space they need to stay balanced. 
On the flip side, you don't want to use too big a space. And this is part of formulating that good plan. Meaning, if you, a horse that maybe let's say is 14 hands, excuse me, with a smaller stride, may not need quite as much space as a horse that let's say a 16 2 with a big, more of a hunt seat type stride. Like I said, you have to kind of, many of our patterns that we, not all patterns, but um, it's more of a trend that we're going to maybe less cone and things like that to where you can develop your roadmap per se in the arena of what works best for you in the arena, what works best for your horse. Like I said, you want to be efficient um, and, and, and give your horse the, uh, be efficient to where it's not so big and so like ridiculously kind of like boring the judge, but yet you want to make sure that you have enough room that your horse can be balanced and, and perform the task as needed. Okay, so communication with the horse a big thing that is super and this is gonna what we're gonna talk about body parts is that you have to be adjustable at all times so when we're communicating our with our horse you're when we talked about that going back to the rules it talked about where your legs need to be your seat your hands and all that now we're taking that rule and we're putting this into practice with the communication with our horse again the rules that are mentioned there are not to bore you or to you know, be cumbersome, but it's trying to get the best um, functionality of the rider. Your, your legs should always be connected with your horse, okay? Because your legs tell, your legs tell your horse's legs and body what they should be doing. When your legs disconnect, it is similar to you when you quit pedaling your bicycle. What happens then? Well, maybe your bike might keep going for a while, but then at some point, if you don't start to pedal again, your bike's just going to stop and nothing's going to happen. On the flip side, when you're um, riding your bike, you don't pedal the whole time. Meaning if you're going down a steep hill, unless you're super brave and super talented, you probably don't want to be pedaling hard going down the hill because you might get going too fast. Um, but even if you're not pedaling, you still want to keep your feet on the pedal to be ready as needed. Same thing with your legs. You're using your legs and adjusting and feeling what you feel your horse needs, but they're always just right there to be um, able to uh, communicate with your horse when you feel that they need just a little more leg, a little less leg, whatever that is, but it's there, your legs are always there communicating with your horse. That's super important. There's a lot of power in your reins and in your, when you're holding your reins, a lot of power in your fingers. So take this analogy, if you will, for just a moment. Um, if you're looking at me, if you have somebody take their hand and put their, I have a ponytail, but let's say I take that out and I put my, a, a stranger put their fingers in my hair on the back of my head, okay? I'll feel every single movement. Now let's say that stranger goes and like really clamps down with their fingers and pulls my hair, it's gonna hurt. Our fingers have a lot of power in them, just as you would um, tell by the pressure that's on your hair. Our horses feel that same pressure on their reins. So what you want to do is also think about being, you know, Flexible on the reins, you know, give and take. Try not to be demanding, you know, feel what your horses need. You know, just the, the next part of this is some people are sensitive when brushing their hair and there's a continuum to, you know, super sensitive to not sensitive at all. I know people that, I'm, you know, you brush their hair and they don't, they don't care. It doesn't hurt. Pull as hard as you want. And then other people, you bring a comb out and they're like, ouch, before you even touch them. Same thing with the horses. They're um, the sensitive sensitivity the horses are relevant both in their mouth as well as on their side our rib cage where your legs go and then as well as on their back as you're sitting there your horse can feel your seat your and remember your upper body is connected with your seat so what your head shoulders and seat do does impact the horse kind of go back to that bike analogy when we um, open our shoulder one way to turn our bike it helps our bike steer it's the same exact thing when we're when we're closing our shoulder to, to where we want the horse to go, they feel that and sometimes we have a hard time guiding because we're telling our horse what one thing to do with our upper body, which is different than what we're doing with our, um, what we want them to do with their body. So kind of consider that. And then back to what I, I think I mentioned this before, horses generally travel where the rider's looking. So if you're looking, let's say for example, you're looking too much to the inside of the circle. 
you're looking way over your shoulder, you're wanting to go to the left, but then your horse keeps making, turning tight. Well, the horse is trying to track where you want them to go. Don't be critical of them for that. Fix where you're looking, see if that helps how they travel. And then, um, like I said, start looking where you want to go because generally horses, they feel where we're looking and that's generally where they want to go. And a lot of the, it's really crazy, a lot of the little um, shoulder dropping things that I see with horses can literally be fixed with just thinking about where we're looking, look over the horse's ears, not, it, it even goes back to that rule, um, our 4-H rule that says about excessive looking will be penalized. It's because excessive looking, meaning looking way over your shoulder, that's excessive looking, um, then that impacts the functionality of where the horse is going. So some of the things like when you're trying to, like I said, this what webinar could actually be a really long time, but um, just a few little things to think about. Um, a lot of standing when riding will help you. So riders should be able to com um, complete all of their maneuvers, whether they're standing or sitting. A lot of times in practice, I'll have the riders stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, no matter what gait they're at. If you are centered and balanced, and you should be able to do that without balancing off of your hands. You should just be able to stand up and sit down without that horse changing. If you're able to do that, that means you're centered and balanced. If you are struggling with standing, almost always that means your legs are getting too far ahead of you and you've lost that line to where um, when we go from our ear to our shoulder down the seam of our pants, um, your foot is ahead of you and then that loses that functionality of our riding and stuff. So um, it's just like a, the recliner analogy. Ask yourself, when you're in a recliner, can you just stand up if you're in the recline position? And the answer is no, you have to get your feet under you. That's the same for riding. If your feet are too far forward, um, you're not able to connect with your horse and ask them to do the things that you want to. So um, just a little thing to think about as you're going. Um, what we do and what we do not do really does matter on a horse. Just the slightest, our horses, we have to give them a lot of credit and a lot of kudos. Our horses are very sensitive and um, what we do and do not communicate to them really does contribute to the horse's performance. So when things go well, we all have had great days. We tend to celebrate and go on and just, you know, things and then, but we have all had bad days or maybe you haven't, but I know I have on horses. When things don't go as planned, a lot of times we tend to blame the horses. However, if we want to be great horsemen and horsewomen, which I think all of you do, we want to step back, analyze, and ask ourselves, what did we as the rider do to either hinder or impact how that horse performed? Um, think about this. When you're riding your bike or driving a car, you know, do we blame the bike or the car when it goes into the ditch and hits a tree? We may have that very small percentage of maybe, okay, you're driving a car and like we have a mechanical malfunction. Forget about that. Um, generally speaking, when, like I said, the bike or the car goes into the ditch and hits the tree, it's generally the driver's fault. And so think about that with the horse too, when the horse does something incorrect, did we do something to impact that? Did we do something to contribute to that? If we did, then we need to fix that before we start being critical of the horse. And then it's, you know, it's one of those things as we're here webinar, because we're, you know, um, in a little bit different time right now, but there's really no substitution for time in the saddle. Um, that in the sense that you're, the more time in the saddle, you're able to ride your horse, you're able to understand your horse's strong and weak points, but more importantly, you're able to um, recognize and know those same things about yourself. Um, and make each ride a quality ride. So maybe you don't have the opportunity to ride every, you know, everybody has different times to where maybe some people can ride every day, multiple times a day, or some people are only able because of their circumstances are able to ride once a week or, you know, whatever your sit situation may be. Um, but make every single step count. Think about what you're doing, what, what you're doing to contribute to the, um, uh, functionality of that horse because that really will go a long way as you try to to continue to improve and become dance partners with your horse. So anyway, we're going to watch a little clip here and 
as this writer goes, this is just a little exercise that I did. As this writer, when he first starts out, you're going to see that he comes through. He's kind of, um, when he first starts turning, he's kind of bossy with his hands. He kind of brings his hand quickly across. You'll see how the horse isn't balanced and kind of, um, you know, doesn't come through. But then as he goes through a couple times, then you're going to see how then um, he also, when he first starts, he's kind of got what we call that outside shoulder closed, meaning he's going to the left, but his, he's leading with his left shoulder, his right shoulder is behind him. As he starts going and collaborating more with his horse, you're going to see how he comes around, his hands softer. He also opens his shoulder in that direction of travel, like we talked with the bike, and you're going to see how this horse is a little more balanced. So like I said, we're going to, as we start watching this, we're going to see how this horse um, goes through and does some of the things. It's, he's practicing square corners. The horse isn't as, as balanced. But then as he changes what he does, the horse hasn't changed. It's the same horse. As he changes what he does, then the horse becomes more balanced. So we come here, you notice he kind of brings his hand across quickly. The horse kind of is kind of all over the place a little bit. Same thing here, turn, turns him sharp. When he comes out, the horse is wanting to drop his shoulder. He's not balanced. He's kind of, like I said, everything's rushed. The sh he's not opening his shoulder in that direction of travel. He's leaving that right shoulder back. We're going to step up into the lope and then now we're going to ask now, you see he opened that shoulder in the direction of travel. You see that horse being much more balanced. Same thing, he comes here, he closes his fingers, he opens that shoulder. That horse was way more balanced when he comes through, just the slightest. And if you weren't looking and see how that horse, he turns, he goes straight line and there's none of that, that unbalanced thing that we had in the first time through. It was very, very subtle and very, very slight when I showed that example, but that example um, right there can show you how just a very subtle change in what the rider does can, um, really did change and impact how the horse performed. And so here we're going to uh, have another little example of, um, we talk, we're, talk, we're going to talk about circles and how to make them a little more symmetrical in a minute. But one of the um, faults of a rider, a lot of times too, when we talk about a not symmetrical circle is we have, we tend to make, if we have a cone, which we will in this um, particular video, we tend to take the, um, instead of having it 50%, we take too much of the circle on one side and don't, excuse me, don't finish it on the bottom side. And here's an example of one he, he goes through and he does the top part of his circle, but when he comes back, he, he does not give his horse enough room to be able to do the bottom half of the circle. And we're going to see a, the horse become unbalanced because the rider kind of panics and he would con consider it in the context that I'm going to have to go to the cone to do a new maneuver. You could see how this would really um, create problems in your, in your pattern. So as he comes through, this looks pretty good. He's coming around. He's creating that circle. He maybe started making it a little big, but then he kind of comes around and he starts, now he forgot that bottom half of that circle. He's kind of makes out and see that horse almost change leads there. Now, luckily he didn't have a maneuver to do at that cone. If he would have, there's no way that that maneuver would have been able to, he would have been able to have a good maneuver because everything would have been late. First of all, he kind of pinched the bottom half of that circle. The horse went to change leads. So then he had to get the horse balanced before he went on and he would have been late at that cone. Again, a very subtle example, but it's just something to kind of look and see that how just us not having that plan to give our horse that space is needed can really be um, critical in, in, in what we're doing. And so we talk about circles. So symmetry of a circle. Each we sh when we're trying to do our, um, to do a circle, we should divide that up in four quarters, just like four quarters. Or what I like to do is ride, riding the clock to where you have, let's see if I have a pointer here. You'd ride 12 o'clock to one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock. In that particular example we had of him riding, our cone was set at nine o'clock. Okay. He rode, he did nine o'clock to 12 o'clock. He did it pretty well. It might have been a little big, but he did a good job. Now when he came back to three o'clock, what he did is at about 3.30, he kind of just came and he forgot to ride the bottom half of the circle. And then when he got about to right here, 
that horse felt um, felt unbalanced because the rider was turning to try to get back to the cone. The, the horse felt unbalanced. He wanted to do a lead change. Probably the left lead was the lead he was more comfortable in. So he's like, oh, if you're gonna, you know, make me go tight, then I'm gonna swap to a lead that I feel more comfortable. And then of course, like we talked about, he wouldn't have had that opportunity to be able to get a good lead change there. If he would have rode three o'clock down to four o'clock, five, it seems kind of repetitive, but for every every circle I have, my riders of of that clock riding every single number on that clock, because if he would have rode down to six o'clock, that would have gave him up through seven o'clock, eight o'clock. As he's coming through to prepare, he would have had from 7.30 to prepare for a maneuver to do um, whatever it was he needed to do at that cone. And so um, we set a clock. Um, so I set cones. So I'll put a middle cone and then I'll walk, walk however, like so let's say so many feet this way to so many feet um, to our cone and then just make it symmetrical. And then we'll have a little exercise here to where we can go ahead and perform that to practice those circles. Riding all that, he rode to three o'clock, has to ride up to 12 o'clock. Make sure he rides to 11, down to nine o'clock. Then down to six o'clock. It's just a really, it's, and then in this particular thing too, he can also practice those transitions through the code. One part of it, some people say, oh, the horse anticipates when they see those cones. Well, that, that is true. However, horse anticipates anyway. So that requires us as riders to be connected with the horse, to remind the horse not to anticipate the things that we're asking them to do. He makes it look quite easy because he's actually riding very functional. He's staying connected with his legs. He's um, communicating with his fingers. It makes it look like he's not doing anything when the fact is he's actually doing a lot with his legs and his fingers all the time. He's a lot of pleases and thank yous and he's trying to communicate with his horse at all times to, to let him know what he needs to do or not do. Like I said, a great rider makes it look like they're not doing anything when in reality they are doing a lot a lot of stuff with their hands, their seat, their, their legs. Going back to the, the slide I talked about, they're being adjustable every single step. So transitions, when we think about doing transitions, we again, I always talk about we want to have a plan, okay? Make sure you have a feel for your horse before that transition, we can't surprise them. On your transitions, always try to be early. You can fake that, but you can't fake being late. You can't fake being late on a transition. A transition should be done as the horse's nose passes through the cone. And if we're early, that gives us time to adjust if that horse is not balanced. Um, if, if, if we're early, then we have that extra step to balance that horse and, and no harm, no foul. It works out, but if we're late, then we, we, can't, we can't recover. We can't fake late. Everybody's gonna, the judge, everybody's gonna know that we're late. Okay, so here's an example of um, him coming through and doing a late transition. Um, when, we, when we come through to watch, he, he comes through, he asks um, for the transit, he didn't really warn his horse, he just kind of got to the cone and popped the horse with his leg. You're gonna, as you watch this transition, like I said, again, this is very subtle, but let's think of this in the big context of things. When he asks, asks this horse for the lope transition, when he gets to the cone, the horse takes a couple little stutter steps. When you watch those stutter steps, those same exact stutter steps could definitely be a spot that a horse that is um, favors one lead or another could take the wrong lead, okay? So kind of think about that. So he's gonna come up, he really didn't, He's jogging nicely, but then he gets to the cone. He kind of doesn't really have a plan. He just kind of asks the horse to lope off. And you can see the couple little stutter steps. It worked for him. Even though it was late, it worked. But like I said, that could have been an example of that horse could have taken the wrong lead, um, could have maybe not loped off. This horse is pretty athletic. So he kind of, even though the rider didn't um, communicate to him effectively, the horse still loped off because the horse is athletic. But if you have a horse that's a little less athletic, you might not have got that nice transition, or it wasn't a great transition, but you might not have got the lope off transition even though it was late. Okay, so let's look at a little bit better transition. He comes through, he starts, if you notice, he starts closing his fingers, closing his legs. 
much better. Even though it's a little early on the cone, I'd much rather have that than being late. That's telling me you have a plan and, and you're able to, like I said, if, if you're early and you need that one more step to balance before you ask for that transition, you have that ability to do so. If you wait till you're at the cone to ask, you don't have that ability to um, be able to do that. And that's the whole thing that we want to think about contextually with the horsemanship is thinking about that communication with our horse. We're a team, we're, there are dance partners, we want to put them together and we want to serve as one unit. So other things to consider when writing a pattern um, before you even go to write it, um, let's say whether this is, um, uh, uh, whether you are doing it like at the show or at, you know, like a lot of times for districts or state horse show, I don't know, I think that many times they post the pattern in advance. Um, always walk your pattern on foot. Um, walk it on foot, meaning you walk, set some pretend cones down. It doesn't have to be the whole, it can be the whole size of the arena or even a small part of the arena. You physically walk it, not on your horse. Um, what that does is it helps us, the more ways we store the pattern in our brain, the more ways it helps us recall in a time of crisis, aka the show pin. Um, we are all nervous when we go into the show pit. It's similar to taking an exam. Okay, many of us have, have test anxiety. If you have test anxiety, you've had to try different ways to learn how to store that information. So when you sit down to take that exam, you're able to recall that information. That's why um, when we're um, studying for a test, um, there's different ways to, re, um, to store that information. We go to class, we read the material, we may do note cards, we may do a study group, we may um, do practice exams, whatever it is. That way, when you sit down for the exam, the more ways you've stored that information in your brain, the more ways that you're able to help um, recall that in the time of crisis. What I call crisis is anytime you're nervous, you're nervous taking an exam, you're nervous in the show pen. Um, the more ways you, you store that, the more ways you're able to recall it. Um, again, we, I always, I've said this probably 10 times already, creating that plan for the roadmap. You need to consider the needs of your horse. You know, if your horse is a little sticky on the lead, you need to give them a little more room to be able to make that um, transition at the comb. Um, another thing to think about is, um, I don't even know if we have overhead projectors so much anymore, but you know, an over, uh, if you don't Google it, you'll understand what I mean, but take an overhead projector and shine that overhead projector down into the arena. You should ride a very similar path as what the, what's drawn. If it's a large circle, it, that's what the, the judge, you know, uh, wants. If there's a large circle, small circle, make, make them different. Sh you know, try to um, do the footprints of the pattern as it would be shown down into your arena. Again, another, ha uh, having that plan, you know, including the parts to be early. And then also remember that your horse also needs to balance from the, the previous maneuver before you can ask them to do a new maneuver. Meaning, let's say you go to the cone, you lope your horse off, and then you have to stop. Well, if your horse wasn't balanced at the lope, your horse is not going to stop well, okay? So kind of keep those things in mind. So preparing at home. If you know your pattern in advance, try not to practice the whole pattern too many times or your horse is going to start anticipating. Break the pattern into parts. Practice those parts. Practice the maneuvers and transitions independently before putting the full pattern together. Um, if you struggle with doing the parts of the pattern, then work on those before pulling in them all together. Again, we all talk about, or uh, I mentioned before, we all have strengths and weaknesses. Same thing when in your pattern. You're gonna have things that are easy for you and things that, that you're gonna struggle with. If you do not have your pattern before arriving at the show, try to anticipate different maneuvers and transitions that you could potentially do in, in those pattern. Work with your horse to become better, you know, um, to be able to compete, um, to complete those as a team. Um, a lot of times we all get nervous about things that we're, I, that I think it's human nature, we get, whether it's fear or anxiety or whatever it is about, you know, I don't do something well. Well, the more we practice it and the more we make it, you know, it may not be something that we can excel at in that pattern, but if we can get through that 
and then we can show other things to excel at. Not everybody is going to have a perfect, you know, not everybody can do every maneuver um, great. And not, and same thing with horse. Horses are like humans. We're right-handed, we're left-handed. They're going to go one way better than the other. Same thing with maybe even us. We may do a circle better to the left than to the right. If you struggle with your right circles, maybe you might want to do, you know, a percentage of 40% your good way, 60% your bad way until it kind of gets together to where they're a little more balanced. You can find some um, examples of patterns online if you don't have any, of, but then even not just practicing those patterns, but practicing the, those transitions and maneuvers of the patterns. Like I said, if you keep doing patterns, 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 your horse is going to get burned out and they're just not going to, they're going to lose interest and it's going to become boring to them. But you can definitely practice different maneuvers and different, uh, you know, and switching things up. You can be creative. You guys are all um, smart people and you can, you know, find ways to be creative to kind of stay ahead of your horse because your horse is smart too. So we have to be just a little bit more creative to stay ahead of, stay ahead of our horse. And then again, like I said, embrace the things that you struggle with. Um, you will get it if you keep working at it. Just like, um, let's say for example, like I'm right-handed. If I, something happened and I broke my hand and I couldn't write with my right hand, I'd probably have to start writing with my left hand. Um, I know I would struggle with it. It would get better if I keep working at it. Same thing or, you know, whatever it is that, ch that challenges you, if you practice and keep working at it, you'll get it. And not all horses are created equal. Just like humans, horses have different tasks and events that they may excel at. For example, when we're talking about humans, one person might have the, may not have the genetics or the physical characteristics to be able to be a world-class gymnast or an NBA basketball player, despite the amount of training that they receive. Um, and horses have similar challenges. You know, um, I, no matter you know, no matter how much I practice, there's no way I could go be a world-class gymnast. I might be able to learn how to do a somersault or a flip. It might take me a very long time, but there's, I, I just don't have the ability to have that flexibility and some, and some, those kinds of things that would, t those skills, even if I practice them, I just don't have the body build and the ability to be able to, to excel at that. I'm, you know, a taller person and stuff. You know, horses, you have to think form to function. Horses have those similar challenges that, you know, depending on their genetics, their physical characteristics, they may or may not be able to um, do an event. However, horsemanship does give us a little bit of flexibility to allow for that horse and rider connection to be taken into consideration. So horsemanship is a class that if you can work with your horse and, you know what I mean, um, show that you're able to be a cohesive unit, that you're able to, you know, have a great dance partner, you will be given, you should be given credit for that. Um, and again, know what your horse excels at and try to highlight that. And then also, again, like we talked about, try to prepare and plan for the parts that will be challenging for you and or your horse, because there will be just like, um, we all have different things that we struggle with when we're on the horse or things our horse struggles with. It's just part of it. There's no, there's no um, way around it. Like I said, horses are like humans. We're right-handed, left-handed. Um, very few horses just get, are able to do um, everything both ways easily. So we're gonna, um, we have two different styles of horses. And so this is, these are two clips from riders that I had um, that went, that compete with the college level. So just a little background. Remember these riders have never rode these horses before. So the first time that they've done a pattern on this horse um, is the first time that they've been on them. But I just want to show you two different types of horse. So if you want to look at the horse, that's fine. But also I want you to really watch the functionality of the rider. Again, as this rider goes, you're going to see um, it doesn't look like she's doing much. However, if we watch the horse go, there's times that the horse gets a little stiff. The horse may anticipate just a little bit, but this horse is adjusting all the, or excuse me, this rider is adjusting every single step and trying to communicate and help this horse to where this is her, the first time with her, this dance partner. She may know this dance with many other partners, but this, 
this rider, this, or excuse me, this horse has a little bit different style. So she's adjusting and you'll see how um, kind of, you'll see where the horse wants to anticipate. Um, but you'll also see what, or maybe get a little stiff at times, but you'll see um, how this rider really adapts. And this is something, like I said, think of, um, this is maybe not the traditional horsemanship style horse, but yet this rider was definitely given credit for um, her ride. And let me find my mouse here. We look, if we again, we draw that line from her ear, down her shoulder, down her shafts, down to her heel. See that nice line right there? This shirt actually really highlights her shoulders. Her shoulders are always square. The horse wanted to back, anticipate. She balanced. The horse has a little quicker stride. She's finding that rhythm. Comes down. The horse, she had to balance. So you saw that moment she went to, she went to trot. That horse got a little stiff. She had to just balance him. Again, the horse got a little stiff, but then she's adjusting with her fingers. It doesn't look like she's doing anything. Her, her hand's not moving, but her fingers are telling that horse a ton. They're working together. And if you, now the horse is licking his lips, it actually started licking its lips over here after she broke to the trot and the, the rider, their dance ended beautifully. So the, the, when they started the dance, they were getting to know each other. And then as they went, the, it really ended beautifully. The rider and the horse, they were just very um, cohesive at the, end of that, at the end of that ride. Oops, what did I do wrong? Um, this is not what I want. Sorry, my technical skills are not very good. I'm going to have to just exit out of here for just a second and figure out what I did. Sorry, everybody. We'll just go to this one. Okay, now here's um, another another style of horse. Again, this is our rider that we saw in the examples earlier, and this is an example of him at um, a competition. But anyway, so another a little bit different style. Again, it's going to look like he's not doing anything, but in reality, he really is. Again, this is a situation where the first time, this is the first pattern he's ever rode on this horse. And so they're learning, they're dance partners. But if we think of this in the context of us riding our own horses, finding that, you know, fine tuning that dance that you ride with your horse, you know, doing the things that you can to make your horse better all the time. Again, we have a high deg degree of difficulty. We have a counter canner going into a corner, which is a very high degree of difficulty. If you're watching him ride, you can barely tell that he's doing anything with his legs, his hand, everything's quiet, it's still. Now we're asked for an extended lope. He's loping with forward motion. He's gonna come a very nice circle. He gave that horse the room. Now he's gonna come down to a collected lope. He's bringing the horse around. Very nice change in circle size. If you notice he, like I said, you can, you, find, you can again find that line from that rider from his ear, his shoulders down to his feet. Very gorgeous uh, trot. Horse is licking its lips. Now we're gonna go up to an extended trot and we're gonna come through, kind of navigate through the arena at the extended trot. Again, he's worked very well with finding that um, balance with that new dance partner. And this is really like a, a testament of what he's doing. He is communicating every single step. Lope off departure. Again, it doesn't look like he's doing anything, but in reality, he is constantly doing 
communicating with that horse. Lots of pleases, lots of thank yous, lots of pleases, lots of thank yous. Just another example of another style of horse. And both of those rides led to championships, even though they were two very different style of horses. So just a couple of points to review as you prepare at home, consider um, what you're doing that contributes or, um, you know, when, when something doesn't go as planned. Be prepared. This means in your practice time and knowing your horse when you go to the show. Remember, you're not competing alone. You have a dance partner. And just like success in any sport, it takes time, practice, and energy to compete, and horsemanship is no different. Does, do we have any questions? Okay, well, what, I'd like to thank you for joining us for our webinar tonight. And if you ever have any questions, please let me know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lori. And then if you guys do have any other questions, um, you're welcome, you are free to email me or, and I can get you in contact with Lori or um, you are welcome to, um, oh yeah, contact me at grace.kim at unl.edu. Um, if you have any specific questions for Lori, I can always forward them those emails to Lori. Um, again, if you want to watch this again later on, this will be on our YouTube page, Equine Webinar Series.